All right. So we're going to chapter six now. What you should have is your Bibles with you. If not, uh, use the printouts, the the printouts that I sent you, uh, either the Word or the PDF document, so that you can annotate, take notes uh, by the sidebar of the scripture references, unless you want to write into your Bibles directly up to you as well. Okay, so turn to chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians and we'll be going through that. Okay, so um, right on the start. Now, remember again, uh, chapter 5, how he ended chapter 5. And remember, this is a letter, so the ideas flow through. Uh, he's continuing in his letter. So in chapter 5, the ending part, he's appealing and is begging them to be reconciled to God because they had turned away uh, to idols and to false teaching. And here, then he continues by quoting Isaiah chapter 49, uh, verse 8. Okay, and he's quoting that because he's saying that, you know, they are made righteous in Christ and they have received the ministry of reconciliation. And so now um, he's appealing to the Corinthians, don't receive God's grace in vain. Now, verse 2 refers to the day of salvation. That is quoting from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. And now what is this day of salvation? He, it's referring to the present period of time. The period of time between Christ's first coming and his second coming. That is the day of salvation, the period of grace. And we are currently in the period of grace, the day of salvation to be reconciled to God. And this period is available to all people and for us as well. So we are called to be reconciled to God in relationship and to be reconciled to one another um, in the body of Christ so that our lives, we don't discredit the ministry and the message of reconciliation. In other words, we can't share uh, the message of love and forgiveness that God has for us and we living out as, as his disciples and yet we in our lives, we don't follow and we don't show love and forgiveness for one another. Then how can we bring that message of reconciliation to others as well? So um, in verse 2, it says, Behold, now the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So it is now also for us, uh, the period of grace. And it's also a very good reminder in our whole theme for this year of One More Nation to Love and a whole theme for the past years of the One More. Really, because now is the day of salvation, this period from the time that Christ came, uh, his first coming to his second coming, uh, it is then for us as ministers of, of reconciliation to then go and share this good news with other people as well during this period of grace, this period of uh, the day of salvation. Okay, so very important reminder for us. Now then from verses 4 to 10, um, Paul starts boasting about his weakness and his suffering. Now in Paul's time, his opponents, the false prophets and false teachers, and also typically many of the other Hellenistic writers, the Greek writers at that time, the culture or the practice uh, of, of these people were to boast about their own virtues, about how good they are, all the positive things about themselves. But Paul is not like that. He boasted about his weaknesses. So you see that in verse 4 to 5, he boasts about how he faced physical suffering, beating, imprisonment, hunger. But yet, he still lived out a very positive a spiritual characteristics of a disciple. And so he lists out also purity, patience, kindness, truth. And he lifted out whether in good situations or bad situations. He was consistent as well. So Paul was boasting about that. Um, and, you know, Paul and Timothy really opened their hearts up to the Corinthians, but the Corinthians were strained in their relationship. Remember this whole period of time, there was all this misunderstanding and strained relationship, right? So they were kind of like holding back their love uh, and in their relationship towards Paul and Timothy. Uh, and, even not just holding back, some of them had turned their affections, their attention to false teaching and even holding on to idolatry and some returning to the old covenant. So here uh, in verses 11 to 13, Paul was really appealing to them, please open your hearts to us again. Okay, so um, appealing to them. 
to have that restored relationship and more than just restored, but then to open their hearts, their heartfelt relationship with them. Now, um, verses 14 to 16, um, because they were, some of them were going back to idolatry and were listening to false teachers, right? So Paul was telling them to separate themselves from all this idolatry and false teaching. And to make his point, to emphasize his point, he asks rhetorical questions. And he uses five examples to show and contrast the difference between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan. So another um, inductive Bible study method is to look for comparisons and contrast. So here it's very uh, clear. Uh, he uses them and you can list them out in your margins as well. So he talks about um, righteousness, lawlessness, light versus darkness, Christ versus Belial, believer with unbeliever, temple of God versus idols. So all these five examples of comparisons to show that, hey, you know, if we don't be bound together. Um, there's no partnership between these two things. There is no agreement. There is no uh, uh, similarities between these two things. There are contrasts. And he, he talks, he brings that to emphasize his point uh, for these Corinthians to separate themselves uh, because they are in Christ. Now, one question you may be asking yourself is what is this? Uh, in verse 15, Belial, I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing correctly. Who is this uh, name that is mentioned here, Belial, in verse 15? Now, this word comes from a Hebrew word, which literally means worthless. Okay, worthless. And in the Old Testament, this term is actually used to describe uh, wicked and lawless people. So, for example, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, now, uh, it's recorded that the sons of Eli, they were priests, and but they were lawless, they were immoral, they were not righteous, they were not doing following the law. And the First Samuel chapter two verse twelve records that they were worthless, Belial. Uh, this word was used to describe Eli's sons. Now, later in Jewish literature and in Jewish writings, this word Belial was also used as a proper noun and a proper name to refer to Satan. Okay, so that's why uh, he, uh, Paul is comparing and saying that there is no commonality, there is no comparison. Uh, there's nothing that is similar between Christ and Satan, okay? And who is worthless. Also. So these are the emphasis that Paul uses to show about do not be bound with unbelievers. Now then from um, 16, 17, 18, Paul quotes a whole bunch of Old Testament passages and I've given you the references there in the notes. And basically, why does he quote? And remember, Paul is a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's very learned in the Old Testament, in the scriptures, in the law. And that's why he's able to bring out uh, all these Old uh, Testament scriptures and basically, he all these verses speak about God's adoption of his people. Okay, he talks about adoption. So he, he does this because he wants to assure and he wants to reassure the Corinthians um, why they should separate themselves from evil and be holy because they are adopted by God. They are holy. They are God's children. And so he's emphasizing that this has been uh, promised and stated in scriptures already, and therefore they should separate themselves from evil and to be holy. Now then he goes on in at just a little on because the thought carries on into chapter seven, verse one. Therefore, cleanse yourself, perfecting in holiness, because you are adopted, knowing all those promises from scripture that you are adopted, there is no comparison, there should not be any uh, likeness with all those five um, examples that he gave. Therefore, cleanse yourself, per uh, perfecting in holiness. Okay, so it's not the other way around, you know, it's not like, oh, I try to act holy, I try to do good, then God will accept me. No, the way of Christ is different and the way of Christ is this, God already has reconciled us, cleansed us, adopted us. God is the initiator. 
and because of what God has done, then our response is really to reconcile with God. So God is the one who stretches out his hand first and we are to then extend our hand in friendship and sonship to shake that hand and reach out to God's hand that is reaching out to us. So because of what he has done, it's really because of God then I want to grow in holiness. I want to reconcile with others and I want to walk in holiness. Now, until we recognize the extent of God's grace and love towards us and towards our lives, um, unless we realize that, then if not, the pride, the self-sufficiency of man will actually hinder us from recognizing that grace that God has given us and it will prevent us from responding in love and obedience. So when we try to do good works and respond from a wrong understanding, it actually then becomes very burdensome and very legalistic. But when we recognize the kind of mercy, the kind of grace and love that God has already given us as an initiator, then really our response is one of gratitude, of thankfulness, uh, and we respond in love. And really, that is the difference um, uh, as a Christian. Okay, so in summary, then, um, no cause for offense. Or really, in other words, don't receive God's grace in vain. Okay, and do not be bound uh, with unbelievers or anything that is unholy and uh, not of God. Okay, so in summary, that is chapter 6. Okay, so we're moving on to chapter 7. Okay, now chapter 7. Um, Paul concludes, now this is the kind of like the conclusion of the whole first big section and he's concluding a long defense. It's really a defense of his ministry and his actions and his love for them. And he repeats again his desire for the Corinthians to open up their hearts to him. Okay, so that's in verse uh, 2 to 4. And uh, in this whole chapter, actually, Paul again talks about, you know, uh, his, his travels and why he's not there and his letter and all that. So let's recap again the timeline uh, so we get an understanding of Paul's timeline uh, when he, then we, we kind of understand what he's talking about here in chapter 7. So his third missionary trip, he goes to Galatia and to Phrygia. Uh, look at your maps, okay? The maps that you have in your last week's notes, then you can actually just plot um, his travels as well. And then he stays in Ephesus, and that's where he writes First Corinthians, okay? Then he visits Corinth, but then he faces that open rebellion just now, we talk, and last week we talked about it, right? He faced that open rebellion against him, and so instead of trying to address uh, and, and do anything there and then, because they were so hardened of heart, uh, then he retreats, he does not uh, continue to stay on, he moves away from them, he goes back to Ephesus and then he writes this tearful letter and he sends Titus to Corinth with this letter. Okay, then he continues his missionary journey, he goes on to Macedonia and then he hears about, oh, their response because Titus comes back uh, after, with, after he, he br brings that cheerful letter, right? And he comes back and reports to Paul about their response, that they have repented. And so then Paul writes Second Corinthians because after hearing that response from Titus. Okay, so now uh, the tearful letter actually caused the Corinthians great sorrow and they repented. Now verses 5 to 16 so that is where he recaps and he talks again about being in Macedonia, how he heard that they repented um, and they're of their obedience. And this report from Titus gives him great comfort. So one of the repeated words that you will see uh, inside uh, chapter 7 is the word comfort again. Comfort, comfort, comfort. So another inductive Bible study method I would encourage you is to look for repeated words. If you can, mark them down in your Bibles or in if you print out separately, mark it down, circle in a, in a way that a common marking, comfort, comfort, comfort. Then that's where you actually, it comes up to you and you can see what are the, the key words or the themes of that chapter. So hearing this report um, greatly gave Paul, uh, gave Paul a lot of joy when he heard of their repentance. And Titus was also comforted and refreshed by the Corinthians when he was there. Uh, and Paul uh, acknowledged that. 
And so he he boasts of them, like, you know, how a parent is so proud of his children and he, he boasts about them. That's what he writes about in chapter 7. Now, verses 8 to 10, um, he addresses their repentance, okay? So because uh, they of the letter, they repented, right? And now it was such a strong worded letter in verse 8. Now Paul says this remark, um, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. Now, that's a bit strange. You regret or you don't regret what he's talking about, right? But because it's such a strong worded letter, he said it was more like, yeah, you know, I wish I didn't send the letter. But so that in, sen in a sense, that regret. But because the letter hurt the Corinthians and it also hurt Paul to write it. So he felt like some regret. Um, but yet, after hearing the results from Titus, he didn't regret sending the letter. So it's like, no, have you ever done been in a situation where you really have to send uh, either a text or talk to someone or write a letter where it's going to be a difficult conversation? Um, maybe it's going to be strong words, but it's something that you have to say and address. And you're not sure whether you want to do it or not. Then you type and you text it and you send it you're like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said that. You know, so you kind of regret it. Um, but then later the response uh, comes back. And, and it's a positive response and you think, oh, okay, good thing I sent that. So that's the kind of situation that Paul is in uh, with regard to the letter that he sent because it was really a difficult letter for him. And again, this letter that he's referring to, now commentators on, on different have different views which letter Paul is referring to. Is he referring to, uh, any, you know, is it First Corinthians or is it the... The second, the one after that, the tearful letter that is no longer found, there's no manuscripts anymore. So there are different thoughts by different commentators uh, on which letter he's referring to. But whatever the case is, we know that there was a previous letter before Second Corinthians that was a very strongly worded letter uh, that was very hurtful to receive and to give as well, but it resulted in the repentance uh, of the Corinthians. Okay. And then he goes on to talk about two kinds of sorrow in verse 10. And he addressed the sorrow. And he says, you know, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So here, Paul actually talks about and highlights two types of repentance, uh, two types of sorrow, sorry. Worldly sorrow, uh, and that brings death and godly sorrow that produces repentance. Now, two examples come to mind uh, that kind of really show case what is worldly sorrow and what is godly sorrow. So we know um, Judas, for example. Judas was very sorrowful after betraying Christ, um, the guilt he had and all, but he hanged himself. Now, he, he focused on himself, his guilty conscience, really brought about that death. And in our world today, how do we see this manifested? It comes in a form of um, we are sorrowful until it, it, we are fearful. Maybe there's guilt, there's shame, there's sadness over some things that we have done in our past or about ourselves. Um, and sometimes it can spiral down into depression. Yeah. And this kind of worldly sorrow it's because we focus on the problem. We focus on the hurt or focus on other people or ourselves. And that's where we have to be careful where our focus is on. That sorrow brings about death. Now, what is godly sorrow? Godly sorrow is different from that. It produces repentance leading to salvation. And the example I can think of is Peter. Peter also, like Judas, um, Peter denied Christ three times. And he... His, he wept bitterly uh, when he heard the rooster crow, right? He he realized it and he wept bitterly. It was so sorrowful. But the difference between he and Judas is that he returned to Christ. He turned back in repentance and he was restored by Christ. So the difference then between that worldly sorrow and godly sorrow is turning to Christ, receiving his grace. Repenting means turning away from sin. And that brings uh, 
that brings salvation. Okay, so um, that's how we can respond also uh, when it comes to repentance. Remember uh, the sorrow that we have if we are dealing with um, a kind of guilt or uh, really um, upset about something that we have done and we would and we do want to repent, we want to change, don't let that guilt eat us away in a form of then keeping looking at the problems or looking at ourselves or the other person, but turn to Christ in repentance. And so this is where we can really learn about leadership from Paul in these chapters, I find. Now, in the world, there are different ways of leadership in how leaders motivate people. But these are... Um, negative examples. So some use fear, shame. Uh, for example, sports coach, they will, sco- they will scold their players. You know, uh, Some will withhold love or use condemnation to try to motivate people to change. Parents, grandparents, uh, we may use reward systems. For example, like, oh, finish your food, finish your homework first, then you get to use your iPad or your computer uh, to play games. Or score, score for A's, you know, and then we'll buy you the latest new tech gadget um, to, to try to motivate them to change, right? Uh, some use nagging, guilt-tripping people to train, to change. And then we, we wonder, you know, why doesn't my husband or wife change? Why doesn't my child bother? Or, you know, why are my staff so unmotivated? Or how come I cannot motivate them? Or why are my CG members or uh, people in a church so indifferent or so uninvolved. I try to motivate them. Um, It doesn't seem to work. That's because we are trying to use men's methods to motivate, to change people. Our love for people, uh, whether is it our family, our children, friends, like it or not, is often conditional. Whether we do it consciously, unconsciously, intentional or unintentional, often it is conditional. Now, where, and these are examples, all, all conditional kind of love to try to motivate change uh, in people. Now, when there is conditional love, when there is uncertainty of love, there is also uncertainty of personal worth and value. So, for example, a child feels that, you know, oh, love is very conditional and he's uncertain of whether he is loved by the parent then his personal worth and value, he's also not sure of himself. And therefore, then there's this fear of failure and unwillingness to take risks or to try to change. And it's safer, you know, to don't try, not try at all, than to fail. And so they don't change and they don't try anything. Now, these are men's uh, methods of motivating. But what we can learn from Paul in how he motivates people, in how he brings about change, um, then it's really, again, we see another sandwich here in uh, chapter 7. Okay, I talked about another sandwich. I think it was earlier in chapter 4. And here, Paul demonstrates leadership. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, he uses unconditional love. He shows unconditional love in his leadership skill, uh, way in how he motivates people the Corinthians is here in this context. So if you look at verse 4, he says, Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy in all our afflictions. And then verse 16, he says, I rejoice that in everything I have confidence in you. Okay, so you see chapter 7 Verse 4 and verse 16, that's the sandwich, the bread. And that word, that, is, that phrase that is repeated in is, great is my confidence in you. I have confidence in you. Now, if we've been following Paul's letter, you might be thinking, how can he say that he has confidence in the Corinthians? After all that they have done, their idolatry, their listening to false prophets, their rebellion and opposition towards Paul, how can he say that he is confident in them? You know, mistakes are repeated over and over again. Sometimes we see and we get disappointed, right, when we see people make mistakes again and again. And we say things like, oh, yeah, last time you were so like this. Or again, same mistake. Why you cannot change? I was wrong with you. Uh, and that's uh, conditional love. But Paul here shows 
unconditional love, um, but he does not accept sinful behavior. Unconditional love doesn't mean that we accept the sin and, and be sinful behavior. No lah, just love lah, never mind, let them do. No, Paul clearly shows in his letter uh, that love comes with rebuking, comes with repentance, showing of repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation. So that is the meat between the sandwich. Okay, the sandwich of a bread, great is my confidence in you. That's the unconditional love that he has. But in between that unconditional love, the, the ingredients that goes into it, the meat uh, is the rebuke, uh, addressing sin, forgiveness, repentance, reconciliation. And when that love is constant and unconditional, it means that even when mistakes are made, for example, the Corinthians, they made those mistakes, right? They, they rebelled against him. They, uh, they, went, they fell back into idolatry, false teaching and all that. Even when those mistakes are made, Paul supported with love, with accountability, with forgiveness. And this creates an opportunity and environment for growth. So what we see here that Paul has, this when he's saying, I have great confidence in you, this is expectant confidence. He lets them know that he's confident that they will grow spiritually towards holiness. Now, it's very easy to show and express confidence in people that we can see and we know that they are doing well, right? If they are trustworthy, they have proven themselves, they are hardworking, they have shown that they are faithful, it's easy for us to say, yeah, I have confidence in this person. But it's difficult to show confidence in a person when there is lack of achievement or, you know, there's nothing to prove that we can be confident of that person. But here we see Paul's example. He shows confidence in them because he has that uh, unconditional love. Uh, and that's what uncondi and unconditional love that Paul shows is really about walking by faith and not by sight. Confidence not in their ability and their performance, but confidence, he was confident in God's ability to change them, the Corinthians. Remember earlier on, he talked about the, the ministry of the Spirit to change them, uh, that they were, were earthen vessels, but even though out on their outer man, they were, they were decaying, they were wasting away, but their inner man was being renewed day by day. So that confidence he had was placed in God's ability to change the Corinthians. And therefore, he said to them, I have confidence in you. Okay? So here, uh, very precious uh, leadership um, example uh, that we can learn from Paul and how we, we relate to people and how we can motivate other people as well. So in summary, then for chapter 7, uh, it's really, he was writing about Titus' report of the Corinthians and how they had that godly sorrow and how they repented. And then the keywords are comfort, boast, repentance, confidence. Okay, so I encourage you to circle or mark those keywords uh, inside the, the scripture that you have there. Uh, then that really helps us to pick out and understand what are the themes of the chapter as well. Okay, so this ends chapters one to seven the whole defense of his apostleship, uh, his ministry, and him reaching out to reconcile uh, and clarify this whole misunderstanding and his relationship with the Corinthians. Very lengthy defense of his apostleship and his ministry, but something that Paul felt that was important for him to clarify with that. Okay, so that was talking about the past. Now we move on to the present. Uh, now, from chapters 8 and 9, Paul now wants to talk about something present, uh, a financial project that has been stalled, and he wants to urge them to complete this financial project. Okay, so a, a present issue at hand that he has to address. And so Paul was going to the church uh, to raise funds, to the Gentile churches to raise funds. Um now, one of the keywords, again, another keyword that is repeated throughout chapters 8 and 9 is uh, charis. Okay, this word is used 10 times. Now, this word is not a Christian term. It's actually a generic Greek word. 
and it has a very wide range of meaning. As you can see there, uh, five kind of different meanings, uh, quite varied in, in, in uh, the essence as well. So for example, karis can be used for to describe uh, the quality or the appearance of a person. The person is attractive or very winsome. So karis is used in that way. Um, the second way the word is used is, uh, you know, like how the master shows kindness towards his servants, that kind of grace and favor towards somebody. The third uh, is a gift, the collection of, uh, of funds and money for the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, Paul used the word charis. So the actual gift, the gracious gift um, is also, charis is also used. Then another example of how this word is used is the effect of generosity and favor. Now, how is this used? For example, in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, uh, Stephen there, uh, it was recorded, Stephen was full of Charis and power, grace and power, and was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So he had divine power that was filling him. And that was the result of uh, the effect of that grace and favor upon him. So the charis is used there to describe that. And the word can also be used as thanks and generosity, a response to generosity, thanks. Okay, thanks, thankful towards some. So a very wide range of use so far for this word charis that is repeated in uh, chapters 8 and 9. And we see that in verses 1, 4, and 6, now Paul here then, he's addressing the money that he's collecting uh, from the Gentile churches to help to fund the poor in Jerusalem because there were Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who were poor. Uh, and he was going about this fundraising project for a number of years, indeed, actually. Uh, and the Corinthians, they actually heard about this collection and they, uh, they wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to com contribute to this collection. So actually in 1 Corinthians, Paul already addressed it and talked about it. And you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 to 3, um, he gave them instructions on what to do, on how to give towards this fund that they were trying to collect for the poor. First, the first instruction is the first day of every week. So something that was regular, put it aside, something that is intentional. He wanted them to be intentional and then to store it up, to save it up. So not leftovers, but to put it aside. So uh, in terms of principles of giving, then regular, intentional, not left over. And Paul talked about how to give. Now, this example in 1 Corinthians, in this letter, Paul is not referring to tithing uh, or offering, but on giving to a cause and a need within the body of Christ. So very specific instructions here. Um, okay, but these are principles that we can learn when it comes to giving. So, Going back to the topic of uh, this fund, this collection that the the Corinthians initially wanted to participate, right? But along the way, it didn't happen. It didn't come to pass. And Paul, so Paul sent Titus to look into the matter. What happened? How come the money was not collected? Now, it was likely because, you know, this whole period, there was strained relationship between Paul and the Corinthians and also distractions. Uh, there were false teachers and so the Corinthians were distracted by these false teachers and likely also their funds or their money was moving, going to fund these false teachers as well. So in 2 Corinthians, now Paul wrote to encourage them to complete what they set out to do. So he's picking up the pieces from there. Uh, so in chapter 8, now he then refers to the Macedonian church. Now the, the churches in Macedonia, they actually face a lot of hardship. They face persecution, extreme poverty, and yet they gave generously and they were willing, doing it willingly for the sake of others in the body of Christ. And it was their choice to give sacrificially. Okay, so Paul then was talking about the example of the Macedonians uh, in how they gave. They gave on their own accord beyond their ability. Then in uh, verse 7 to 15, 
he he wanted to address this whole issue of generosity. And he uses, continues the, the idea and the thought. He uses the two examples, the Macedonian church, and he talks about Christ as well in, in the area of generosity. Now, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 8, he's saying, no, I'm not giving a command. He's not giving a command to them because otherwise it won't be willing and generous, right? But it is an opportunity for the Corinthians to give and to show their sincere love for other believers. So it was them to express love through their actions by giving. Now, Paul didn't bring up the Macedonians uh, as an example to the Corinthians because he wanted to, you know, shame the Corinthians or, or, or make them feel bad. But rather, it was to be an encouragement to them and it, as an example of how one lives out faith in love and good deeds. So it, it's seen in your action. And he points everything back to the example of Christ in verse 9. And he says, you know, the ultimate generosity and example of love in action uh, is Christ because Christ willingly offered himself as a sacrifice uh, for everyone so that we who are spiritually poor then can become rich. And so he's encouraging them. You know, you wanted to take part in this, uh, so follow through on your desires. So verse 10 and 11, follow through on what you set out to do. Okay. Now, one interesting thing uh, in verse 13 to 15, Paul uses this word. Uh, different translations give different words. Um, in the NASB, it's translate it says as for this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction but by way of equality uh, some put fairness now so some translations put fairness so this equality thing what is this that Paul is talking about he's not talking about communism here um, but Paul again quotes another Old Testament in verse 15 he quotes Exodus chapter uh, 6 chapter 16, verse 18, where in Exodus, God actually supplied the needs of the Israelites, right? Remember when they were in the wilderness, God provided manna for them. And how God provided manna was that no one had too much, no one had too little. Everybody had just nice manna for the day. So the church should do likewise. You know, the the plenty that the Corinthian church had. Remember the profile of Corinth? They were wealthy. They were a pot city. They were a Roman colony. They were wealthy. Uh, they were wealthy. Uh, and he, he said that, you know, the Corinthian church, you have plenty, right? So supply the needs to others. And in turn, one day, when you are in need, then the whole network of churches, the whole body of Christ will come to your aid as well. Okay, so that's what he was trying to say down here. So similarly, when you think about uh, food, when you eat food, when food is digested, the nutrients are distributed to the whole body, right? Every part of the body. Uh, and so that's why, remember, the church is the body of Christ. It goes and shares to the whole body. The whole body is nourished. So here, Paul is then encouraging them uh, to give to the brothers and sisters uh, in Jerusalem who needed that. Okay, so that's what Paul was addressing here. And then from verses 16 to 24, uh, then Paul talks about his co-workers. Okay, here he wants to mention his co-workers, uh, three of them. And he's giving a recommendation for Titus and two other unnamed men who delivered this letter, 2 Corinthians, to the Corinth church. And he's referring to them as messengers. Um, now, he describes Titus in verse 16 and 17 as uh, a co-worker, one who shares his concerns and his values. Then there's another brother mentioned in verse 18 and 19, and he describes him as having good reputation chosen by the churches to travel with Paul. And then the other uh, brother, another unnamed person, but in verse 22, he describes him as someone who is tested and proven diligent. So he had high praise uh, and good testimonials for these three co-workers uh, and messengers of Paul. Now then, something for us to think about and reflect for ourselves. 
what about us? What about you? If someone were to write a testimonial letter for you, what would it be? You know, will it be on worldly credentials? Um, how much would a person write about your godly traits? Or if you think about it in another way, a eulogy at our you at our funeral. If someone were to give a eulogy about us, would they say, you know, all our earthly credentials? Oh, wow, this person has a doctorate in what? He was the CEO of this company, blah, blah, blah. blah. Or would they describe us as someone with godly traits, someone who was generous, someone who loved unconditionally, someone who was faithful, uh, diligent in the work of Christ, as how Paul described his co-workers. So I hope that, you know, uh, as much as yes, we want to do well in this world and we want to do excellent work because we work for Christ. Um, we also want to develop uh, godliness and holiness uh, such that, you know, when others do talk about us, yeah, are they able to see those godly traits in us and speak of it as well? So something to reflect uh, in our words and our, in our deeds as our walk as disciples of Christ. So in summary, the theme for uh, chapter 8 for the Corinthians uh, began this gracious gift. So now finish it. Okay, he's encouraging to finish it. And the key words are give, gift, grace, gracious. So charis is that key word that is repeated uh, quite often. So chapter 9, again, he continues with this whole topic about this uh, financial project that they are to continue they, to press on, to give, to finish it. Okay, and he's talking about, um, you know, complete it so that we can avoid two embarrassing situations. Uh, well, not because to avoid, but yeah, he doesn't want these embarrassing situations to crop up, you know, so he's telling them, what are these two embarrassing situations that might happen that he wants to avoid? Well, remember Paul is boasting about them. He's so confident of them, right, of the Corinthians, and he's so proud of them, like a spiritual father of them. And he keeps boasting to them of the Macedonians. Uh, and so, you know, if they don't complete this financial project, then ah, yeah, it'll be so embarrassing because he has been boasting about them to the Macedonians. And then, you know, what if the fund, the collection is not ready, right? So he wants to avoid that. And the other thing to it he wants to avoid is when he comes to visit Corinth, he might have uh, some delegates, some Christians uh, from the Macedonian churches that will accompany him uh, and his group to Corinth if they might come. And so what if they come and they find that, oh, they are unprepared with their gift. The collection of the gift is not ready. And that would be embarrassing for the Corinthians and for Paul. And so that's something that he wants to avoid uh, for them. Okay, so he's telling them that. And now, there's this another unusual word that comes up in uh, chapter 9, verse 5. What does Paul mean when he says that for your giving is not to be affected by covetousness? I think covetousness is used in the NASB translation, um, but exaction is used in the ESB. Not sure whether what are the other uh, translations, what word they use, but the Greek word pleonexia okay, can be understood uh, in two ways. And sometimes it's good for us to go back into the original language to understand because the word can be used in multiple meanings, right? So uh, what does how can we understand? What does it mean by giving not to be affected by covetousness? So this word can mean that the Corinthians are not to give grudgingly as if or a result of wanting to get more. So giving so that, oh yeah, I can get more in return. Okay, that's why that's that sense of covetousness. Don't give because you want more. Or uh, don't give as if it's like extortion like that. We are, we are extorting money out of you. Okay, so um, that is one of the um, explanations of why the word covetousness was used here. Okay, so earlier on then we talked about this word. Pleonexia. So you can also go to Blue Letter Bible to find out a little bit more about this Greek word. Just key in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, and then look for 
the English word and then click on the number beside it to be able to see the explanation. Right? So here then Paul is saying, yeah, don't give because you want and you desire to get more in return. Okay, so that, that kind of covetousness in giving. So let's carry on for verses 6 to 15. Now it's interesting that in verse 10, if you turn to chapter 9, verse 10, Paul says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Do you notice a very interesting thing here? He supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. From start to finish, the whole process. God supplies the seed to the sower, the beginning, the start of, of the whole process. And at the end process, he supplies the bread for food. So God is involved in both the first and the last item in the whole process of sowing, harvesting, making the final product. And it, it's a reminder for us then really that how we are able to make money, um, God is the one who enables us to do that as well. From the start, like even finding our jobs, getting our jobs, in the process of our jobs, uh, to be able to be blessed uh, with the finances as well. To the end, what we have, um, God is the one who actually supplies. It is a reminder for us that it's not of our own efforts and of ourselves, but it's the grace that we, we have received from God that helps us um, and through that process and so. Okay, so in chapters 9 and 10, Paul really outlines the whole principle of giving under the new covenant, which succeeds the old covenant of tithing. I believe, if I'm not wrong, there is no mention of tithing uh, in the New Testament and also in the letters to the churches. Okay, but it's really uh, about sacrificial giving or giving as a response, giving out of love. So Paul is not commanding or demanding that the church gives, but Paul does exercise his spiritual authority by highlighting to the church, to the Corinthians, that um, because you have freedom as individuals to be personally responsible to God, not reluctantly, not forced, but we can give cheerfully. So Really, then, the principle of giving in the New Testament is not bounded by the law of tithing, but actually more than that, it is sacrificial living, the giving of our whole self in response to the grace and the love that God has given uh, and shown us. So really responding in love. And so therefore, we can give generously uh, and we can give sacrificially because God is involved in the one who's supplying the seeds and the bread, the whole process of how we are able to make money, how we are able to uh, have what we have. God is involved in that. Therefore, we can be generous. And so verses 6 to 15 actually shows there are results of generosity, of giving generously. One, the givers themselves are enriched to be generous. So yes, uh, we God does bless uh, us so that we can be generous. But again, Paul cautions, right? Don't give because you want to get more for yourself. Yeah, but God enables us to be generous and blesses us more so that we in turn can be generous to other people. So the givers are enriched to be generous. And then second, the result is, second result is that the receiver's needs are met, definitely. Practical needs are met. And God is praised. Okay, so Paul ends this segment. So the beginning, he starts with a praise, a doxology in chapter 1. Uh, here in chapter 9, he does give praise again to God in chapter 9, verse 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And the gift here then he's referring to is God's generosity and grace upon our life uh, through the, his gift of the Son of God, Christ, in our lives. So may we always remember that we are... Uh, we give because God first gave and God was first generous towards us. And therefore, we can be generous also. So in summary then, chapter 9, uh, it's really a, a continuation of the thought of, of chapter 8 to 
contribute to give to generously uh, to this contribution. Okay. And the keywords are giving bountiful generosity. So chapter eight was about, yes, complete this project that you started. How are we to complete it? What is the kind of attitude and mentality that we have towards giving? Chapter 9 then says, give generously because Christ gave generously towards us and therefore we can be generous also. So in a nutshell, then a summary of the second portion uh, of Paul's letter when he addresses the present issue at hand is in chapter 8 and 9 where he's really talking about completing this financial project, addressing this financial project uh, that the Corinthians started out to and he wanted them to finish it and do it generously.